tongues of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage. Princes to act. And monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then the warlike Harry, like herself, assumes the port of Mars. And at her heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million. And let us, ciphers to this great account, on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high, uprearing, and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man to make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses. <laughs> turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass, for the which supply admit me chorus to this history. Which prologue-like your humble patience pray. Gently to hear. Kindly to judge our play. <clears throat> I'll tell you, that same bill is urged, which in the eleventh year of the last king's reign was like and had indeed against us past, but that the scrambling and unquiet time did push it out of farther question. But how, my lord, shall we resist it now? It must be thought of. If it pass against us, we lose the better half of our possession. For all the temporal lands which men devout by testament have given to the church, would they strip from us, thus runs the bill. This would drink deep would drink the cup and all. But what prevention? The king is full of grace and fair regard. And a true lover of the holy church. The courses of her youth promised it not. The breath no sooner left her father's body but that her wildness, mortified in her, seemed to die too. Yea, at that very moment, Consideration, like an angel came, and whipped the offending Adam out of her. Never came reformation in a flood, with such a heady current scouring faults as in this king. We are blessed in the change. Yet it is a wonder how her addiction was to courses vain, her companies unlettered, rude, and shallow, her hours filled up with riots, banquets. Sports. Never noted in her any study, any retirement, any sequestration from open haunts and popularity. The strawberry grows underneath the nettle, and wholesome berries thrive and ripen best, neighbored by fruit of baser quality. It must be so, for miracles are ceased. But, my good lord, how now for mitigation of this bill urged against the church? Doth her majesty incline to it or no? She seems indifferent, or rather swaying more upon her heart. For I have made an offer to her majesty as touching France to give a greater sum than ever at one time the clergy yet did to her predecessors part with all. How did this offer seem received, my lord? With good acceptance of her majesty. Say that there was not time enough as of to hear as of her true titles to some certain dukedoms, generally to the crown and seat of France. What was the impediment that broke this off? The French ambassador, upon that instant, craved audience. And the hour, I think, has come to give her here. Is it four o'clock? It is. Then go we to know her embassy. 
which I could with a ready guess declare before the French woman speak word of it. God and his angels guard your sacred throne and make you long become it. Sure. We thank you. My learned lord, we pray you to proceed and justly and religiously unfold why the lost Salic that they have in France or should or should not bar us in our claim. And God forbid, my dear and faithful lord, that you should fashion, rest, or bow your reading, or nicely charge your understanding soul with opening titles, this create whose right suits not in native colors with the truth. For God doth know how many now in hell may drop their blood in approbation of which your reverence shall incite us to. Therefore, take heed how you upon our person. Take heed how you awaken our sleeping swords of war. We charge you, in the name of God, take heed. For never two such kingdoms did contend without much fall of blood whose guiltless drops are every one a woe, a sore complaint against him whose wrong makes edge into the swords that makes such waste in brief mortality. Under this conjuration, speak, my lord. And hear me, gracious sovereign, and you peers, that owe yourselves your lives and services to this imperial throne. There is no bar to make against your highness claim to France but this which they produce from Pharamond, in terum salicum mulieres me sucerat. Oh. No woman shall succeed in Salic land. Which Salic land the French unjustly glows to be the realm of France, and Pharamond, the founder of this law, and female, Bob. Yet their own authors faithfully affirm that the land Salic is in Germany, between the floods of Sela and of Elbe, where Charles the Great, having subdued the Saxons, there left behind and settled certain French, who, holding in disdain the German women, uh, for some dishonest manners of their life, uh, established in this law, to wit, no female should be inheritrix in Salic land. Well, then does it well appear that the Salic law was not wise for the realm of France, nor did the French possess the Salic land until 401 and 20 years after the function of King Pharamond, idly suppose the founder of this law. Uh, besides, their writers say, King Pepin, which deposed Childric, did, as heir general, being descendant of Blithold, which was daughter to King Clothair, made claim and title to the crown of France. So that, as clear as is the summer sun, King Pepin's title and all sense appear to hold in right and title of the female. May I? So do the kings of France unto this day. How be it they would hold up this Salic law to bar your highness claim from the female? May I, with right and conscience, make this claim? The sin upon my head, dread sovereign. Stand for your own. Unwind your bloody flag. Look back into your mighty ancestors. Go, my dread lord, to your great-grandsire's tomb from whom you claim. Invoke his warlike spirit. <clears throat> uh, you are their heir. You sit upon their throne. The blood and courage that renowned dead runs in your veins. And my thrice puissant liege is in the very maymorn of her youth, ripe for exploits and mighty enterprises. Your brother kings and former monarchs of the earth do all expect that you should rouse yourself, as did the former lions of your blood. They know your grace hath cause and means and might, so doth your highness. Ne'er king of England had nobles richer and more loyal subjects, whose hearts have left their bodies here in England, and lie pavilioned in the fields of France. Oh, let their bodies follow, my dear liege, with blood and sword and fire to win your right, in aid whereof we, of the spiritual team, will raise your highness such a mighty sum as never at one time did the clergy bring in to any of your ancestors. We must not only arm to invade against the French, but lay down our 
portions to defend against the Scot. Aye, there's a saying, very old and true. If that you will France win, then with Scotland first begin. Oh. For once that eagle England, being in prey to her unguarded nest, the weasel Scot comes sneaking, and so sucks her princely eggs, playing the mouse in absence of a cat. While the arm and hand fights abroad, the advised head defends itself at home. For government, though high and low and lower, puts into full consent, agreeing in a full course like music. And so work the honeybees, or creatures that by a rule in nature teach the act of order to a peopled kingdom. To France, my liege, divide your happy England into four, where take you one quarter into France, and you withal shall make all Gallia shake. If we, with thrice such powers left behind at home, cannot defend our own doors from the dog, let us be worried, and our nation lose the name of hardiness and policy. Call in the messenger sent from the dog. Are we well prepared to hear the pleasant pains of our fair cousin, Dauphin? For we hear this message is from him, not the king. Thus then, in few, your highness, lately sending into France, did claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III. In answer of which claim, the prince, our master, says you savor too much your youth and bids you be advised. There's naught in France that can be with the nimble Gallier one. You cannot revel into dukedoms there. He therefore sends you, me here for your spirit, this kind of treasure. And in lieu of this, desires you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This the Dauphin speaks. What treasures? Tennis balls, my liege. We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. Mm -hmm. His present and your pains we thank you for. And we understand him well. But tell the Dauphin I will keep my state. Be like a king and show my sail of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. For that I have laid by my majesty and plotted like a man for working days. And tell the Dauphin that this mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock mock out of dear husbands, mock fathers from their sons, mock castles down. And there are many yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. So, get your hands in peace. And tell the Dauphin that this jest of his will savor but of shallow wit, when thousands weep more than did laugh at it. Convey them with safe conduct very well. This was a merry message. We hope to make the sender blush at it. Therefore, my lords, omit no happy hour that may give furtherance to our expedition, for now we have no thought in us but friends. Save those to God that run before our business. Therefore, let every man now task his thought that this fair action may on foot be brought. Now all the youth of England are on fire, and the silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now thrive the honorers, and honor's thought reigns solely in the breast of every man. They sell the pasture now to buy the horse, following the mirror of all Christian kings with winged heels as English mercuries. 
for now sits expectation in the air, and hides a sword from hilt unto the point with crowns imperial. Crowns and coronets promised to Harry and her followers. The French, advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shake in their fear. And with pale policy, seek to divert the English purposes. Oh, England! Model to thy inward greatness, like little body with a mighty heart. What mightst thou do? That honor would be due, were all thy children kind and natural. Well met, Corporal New. Good morrow, Lieutenant Bardo. Why, are you in private pistol friends yet? For my part, I care not. I say little, but when time shall serve, there shall be smiles. But that shall be as it may. I dare not fight, but I will wink and hold out my iron. It is a simple one, but what though? It will toast cheese, and it will endure cold as another man's sword will, and there's an end. Come, I will bestow a breakfast to make you two friends. We must all three to France together. Let it be so, good Corporal Nim. Faith, I will live so long as I may. That is a certain of it. And when I can live no longer, I will do as I may. That is my rest. That is the rendezvous of it. It is certain, Colonel, that he is married to Nell quickly. <laughs> for certainly she did you wrong, for you were troll quite to her. I cannot tell. Things must be as they may. Men may sleep, and they may have their throats about them at that time. And some say knives have edges. It must be as it may. Though patience be a tired mare, yet she will plod. There must be conclusions. Well, I, I cannot tell. Here comes Brian and Bristol! No, for my manly heart doth yearn. How now, my host pistol? Base tight, cost thou me host. Mm -hmm. Now by this hand I swear I scorn the term, nor shall my Nell keep lodgers. <laughs> no, by my troth, not long. For we cannot lodge and board any dozen or fourteen gentlewomen who live honestly by the pick of our needles, but it will be thought we keep a body house straight. <laughs> oh, well a day, lady, if you be not drawn. Now we shall see willful murder and adultery committed. Good corporal, good lieutenant, offer nothing here. Hitch. Hitch for thee, Iceland oh. dog. Now prick your cur of Iceland. Good corporal, Nim, show thy valor and put up thy sword. Will you shove off? I would have you so. Solace, egregious dog. Oh, viper, vile, the solace. In thy most marvelous face, the soulless in thy teeth, and in thy throat, and in thy hateful lungs, yeah, and in thy maw, per thee, and which is worse, within thy nasty mouth, I do retort the soulless in thy bowels, for I can take, and pistol's cock is up, and flashing fire will fall. I have the humor to knock you indifferently well. If you should grow towel with me, pistol, I should scour you a little with my rapier, as I may, in fair terms. If you would walk off, I would prick your guts a little, as I may, in good terms, and that's the humor. Oh, braggart, vile, and damned, furious woman, the grave doth gape, and toting death is near, therefore exhale. Hear me! Hear me what I say! We must all three to France together. I am a soldier, and they that runs the first stroke, I'll run them up to the hills. An oath of mickle might, and fury shall abate. Give me thy fist. Thy forefoot to me give. Thy spirits are most tall. I will cut thy throat one time or another, and that's the humor of it. Come, shall I make you two friends? We must to France together. Why the devil should we keep knives to cut one another's throats? I'll have the eight shillings you won of me at betting. A noble shalt thou have, and present pay, and liquor likewise I will give to thee, and friendship shall combine, and brotherhood I 
live by Nim, and Nim will live by me. Is this not just? For I shall suckler be unto the camp, and prophets shall approve. Give me thy hand. I shall have my money. In cash, must justly pay. Shall we shog? The king will be gone from Southampton. Oh, come, let's away. My love, give me thy lips. Yo, fellows in arms, let us to France, like horse leeches, my boys, to suck, to suck, the very blood to suck! Yes! Woo! Adieu! And see thy fault France hath in thee found out, a nest of hollow bosoms. Which he fills with treacherous crowns. And three corrupted souls. One, Richard Earl of Cambridge. And the second, Henry Lord Scroop of Masham. And the third, Sir Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland. Have, for the guilt of France. Oh, guilt indeed. Confirmed conspiracy with fearful France. And by their hands, this grace of kings must die. My Lord of Cambridge. And my kind Lord Scroop. And you, my gentle knight, give me your thoughts. Think you not that the powers we bear with us will cut their passage through the force of France? No doubt, my if liege. If each man do his best, well, we doubt not that, since we are well persuaded we carry not a heart with us from hence that grows not in fair consent of ours, nor leave not one behind that doth not wish success and conquest depend on us. Never was a monarch better feared or loved than is your majesty. There's not, I think, a subject that sits in heart grief and uneasiness under the sweet shade of your government. True, those that were your father's enemies have steeped their galls in honey and do serve you with heart's creative duty and of zeal. We therefore have great cause of faithfulness and will forget the office of our hands sooner than the quittance of desert and merit according to their weight and worthiness. So service shall with steeled sinews toil, and labor shall refresh itself with hope to do your grace incessant services. We judge no less. Uncle of Exeter, enlarge the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was an excess of wine and set him off. <laughs> that is mercy, but too much security. Let him be punished, sovereign, lest example breathe by his sufferance more of such a kind. Oh, let us yet be merciful. So may your highness, and yet punish too. Okay. Sir, you show great mercy if you give him life after the taste of much correction. Alas, <laughs> your too much love and care for me are heavy orisons against this poor wretch. If little faults proceeding on distemper shall not be winked at, what shall we do in capital crimes, chewed, swallowed, and digested, appear before us? Will you add an honor to that then? Though Cambridge, Scroop, and Gray, in their dear care and tender preservation of our spirit, would have them punished. And now, to our French causes. Who are the late commissioners? I, one, my lord. Your Highness bade me ask for it today. And so did you me, my liege. And me, my royal sovereign. But these are yours. Lord of Cambridge, Scroop of Masham, and these same are yours, Sir, Knight, Grey of Northumberland. Read them, and know I know your worthiness. <laughs> my uncle and my lord of Westmoreland, we will aboard tonight. How now, gentlemen? Gentlewomen. What see you in those papers that you lose so much complexion? Look ye how they change. Their cheeks are paper. I do confess my fault. And do submit me unto your highness's mercy. To which we all appeal. The mercy that was quick in us, but late by your own counsel, is suppressed. And kill. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy. See you, my princes and my noble peers, these English monsters. My lord of Cambridge here at work, you like crowns, lightly conspired, and sworn unto the practices of the French to kill us here in hand. 
say to be forceful, thou cruel, vile, ingrateful, and inhuman creature, thou that didst bear the key to all my counsels, that knewest the very bottom of my soul, make it be possible that foreign hire could out of thee extract one spark of evil that might annoy my finger. It seems so strange. But though the truth of it stands off so gross, treason and murder ever kept together, like two yoke devils sworn to either's purpose, working so grossly in a natural cause that admiration did not look at them. And thus, my fall has left the kind of blood to mark the full front man and best endure it with some suspicion. I will weep for thee. For this revolt of mine, methinks, is like another fall of man. Their faults are open. Arrest them to the nature of the law, and God acquit them of their practices. I arrest thee of high treason by the name Richard, Earl of Cambridge, Henry, Lord Scroop of Masham, and Sir Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland. Our purposes God justly hath discovered. And I repent my fault more than my death, which I beseech your highness to forgive, although my body pay the price of it. For me, the gold of France did not seduce, although I did admit it as a motive, the sooner to effect what I intended. Never did faithful subject more rejoice at the discovery of most dangerous treason than I do at this hour, joy or myself, prevented from a damned enterprise. My fault, but not my body. Pardon, sovereign. God, put you in your mercy. Hear your sentence. Touching our person, seek we no revenge, but we our kingdom's safety must so tender, whose ruin would have sought the to our laws we do deliver you. Get me, therefore, hence, poor, miserable wretches, to your death. full power upon us, and more than carefully in us concerns to answer royally in our defenses. Therefore, the Dukes of Berry and of Britain, of Brabant and of Orleans shall make forth. And you, Prince of Farm, with swift dispatch to line and new repair our towns of war with men of courage and of means defended. For England, her approaches makes as fierce as the waters to the sucking of a gulf, and it fits us then to be as provident as fear may teach us out of late example left by the fatal and neglected English upon our lands. My most redoubted father, it is most meet we arm us against the foe, for peace itself should not so dull the kingdom, and that defenses, musters, preparations should be maintained, assembled, and collected as were a war in expectation. Therefore, I say, tis me, we all go forth to view the sick and feeble parts of France. But let us do it with no show of fear. No, no more than if we heard that England were busy with the Wits and Morris dance. For my good liege, she is Ivy King, her scepter so fantastically borne by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous youth that fear attends her not. No peace. Prince Dauphin, you are too much mistaken in this king. Question, your grace, the late ambassadors, with what great state she heard their embassy? How well supplied with noble counselors, how modest in exception, and withal how terrible in constant resolution, and you shall find her vanities forspent. Well, tis not so. 
my Lord High Constable. But though we think it so, it is no matter. In cases of defense, tis best to weigh the enemy more mighty than he seems. Think we King Harry strong? The kindred of her hath been fleshed upon us. And she is bred out of that bloody strain that haunted us in our familiar paths. Witness our much too memorable shame when Crescent Battle was fatally struck, and all of our princes captive by the hand of that black man. Edward, Black Prince of Wales, this is a stem of that victorious stock, and let us fear the native mightiness and fate of her. Ambassadors from Harry, King of England, do crave admittance, my liege. We'll give them present audience. Go and bring them. You see, this chase is hotly followed, friends. Turn head and stop pursuit, good sovereign. Take up the English short and let them know of what a monarchy you are the head. Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. From our brother England, from her, and thus she greets your majesty. She wills you by the name God Almighty, that you divest yourself and lay apart the ball of glories by that gift of heaven, by law of nature and of nations, to her and to her heirs, the crown of France, which you may know tis no awkward claim. Picked from the wormholes of long vanished days, nor the dust of old oblivion ranked, this most memorable line she sends you, in every branch truly demonstrative, willing you overlook this pedigree. And when you find her evenly derived, a most famed of famous ancestors, Edward the Third. She bids you then resign your crown and your kingdom to her, the challenger in true native. Or else what follows? Bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown, even in your heart, there she will wake for it. Therefore in fierce tempest is she coming, in thunder and in earthquake, like a god, that if requiring fail, she will compel, and beats you in the bowels of the Lord, to litter up your crown, to take mercy on those poor souls for whom this hungry war opens its vasty jaws for, and on your head, turning the widow's tears and orphans' cries and dead man's blood and the pining widow's groans for husbands and fathers and betrothed lovers from whom shall be swallowed in this controversy. This is her claim, her threatening in my message. Unless the Dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting to. For us, we will consider this further. For the Dauphin, I stand here for him. <laughs> what to him from England? Scorn and defiance, slight regard, contempt in anything that may not miss become the sender, doth she prize him. Thus says my king that if your father's highness do not ingrain all demands at large, she'll call you to so hot an answer for it that caves and womanly voltages of France so Shine at second accents of her ordinance. Say, <laughs> if my father renders fair return, it is against my will. For I desire nothing but aught with England. As matching to his youth and vanity, I did present him with the Paris balls. Soon make your Paris move shake for it. And be assured you'll find the difference between the promise of her greener days, and these she masters now. Now she wastes time, even to the utmost grain, that you shall read in your own losses as you stay in friends. Tomorrow you shall know our mind at full. Dispatch us with all speed, lest that our king herself come here to question our delay. For she has footed in this land already, 
You shall be soon dispatched with fair conditions. A night is but small breath and little pause to answer matters of this consequence. Thus with imagined wing our swift steam flies, and motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Hampton Pier embark his royalty. And her brave fleet. Play with your fancies, and in them behold, upon the hempen tackle, ship boys climbing. Hear the shrill whistle which the order gave to sounds confused. Behold the threatened sails, borne with invisible and creeping wind. Draw the huge bottoms through the furrowed sea, breasting the lofty surge. Oh, think you do but stand upon the rivage, and behold, a city on the inconstant billows dancing. For so appears this fleet majestical. Hold in due course to her fleur. Follow! Follow! Grapple your minds to sturdage of this navy. Work, work your thoughts, and therein see a siege. With fatal mouths gaping on girded her fleur. Suppose the ambassador from the French comes back. Tells Hale that the king doth offer her Catherine, his daughter, and with her to dowry some petty and unprofitable duke. The offer likes not. And the nimble gunner, which lends stock now, the devilish head in touches. And down goes all before the them. Sufficient for look here. 
The adversary you may discuss unto the duke, look ya, is digged himself four yards under the catamines. By Jesus, I think it will blow up all if there's not better directions. Well, the book of Gloucester, to whom the order of the siege is given, is altogether directed by a patriot. Oh. A very valiant gentleman in faith. It is Captain McMorris, is it not? I think it be. By Jesus, he is an ass. Oh. There's any he is in the world. I will better pass much in his sideburns. He has no more direction in the true disciplines of the wars. Look here, the Roman disciplines. That is a puppy dog. Oh, here it goes. And the other captain, Captain Jamie, with him. Captain Jamie is a marvelous, valorous gentleman. That is so. And of great expedition and knowledge in the ancient wars upon my particular knowledge of his directions. I say good day, Captain Fluellen. God damn to your worship, good Captain James. How now, Captain McMorris? Have you quit the mines? Have the pioneers given off? My Christ, my it is done. The work is given over, the trumpets sound the retreat. By my hand, I swear, and my father's soul, the work is ill done. It is give over. I would have blown up the town, so Christ oh, save me. La, in and out. Oh, it is ill done. Tis ill done by my hand. Tis ill done. Captain Rappos, I beseech you now. Will you vouchsafe me? Look here, a few disputations with you as partly touching or concerning the disciplines of the wars, the Roman wars, in the way of argument, look here, and friendly communication, partly to satisfy my opinion, and partly for the satisfaction, look here, of my mind as touching the direction of the military discipline. That is the point. It shall be very good, good faith, good captains both, and I shall quit you with good leave. As I may pick occasion, that shall I marry. It is no time to discourse, Sir Christ save me. The day is hot, and the weather, and the wars, and the king, and the dukes. It is no time to discourse. The town is besieged, and the trumpet calls us to the breeze. By the mess, ere these eyes of mine put themselves to slumber, I'll do good service, or I'll lie on the ground for it. I owe God a debt, and I'll pay it as valorously as I may. That shall I surely do, and that is the brief and the long of it. <clears throat> Captain McMorris, I think, look here, under your correction, there's not many of your nation. Oh, now. my nation? What is my nation? Is the a villain, a, a, a bastard, a, a, a knave, and a rascal? What is my nation? Who talks of my nation? Look, if you take the man otherwise than is meant, Captain McMorris, per adventure I shall think you do not use me with that affability as in discretion you ought to use me. Look, you being as good a man as yourself, both in the disciplines of war and in the derivation of my birth and in other particularities. I do not know you so good a man as myself. So Christ save me, I'll cut off your head! Oh, God. not, 
why in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your shrill, shrieking daughters? Your father, taken by silver beards, their most reverend heads dashed to the walls. Your naked infant spinning upon pikes while the mad mothers with howls confuse you break the clouds. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid? Or guilty in defense be thus destroyed? Our expectation had this day an end. The default to whom of successors we entreated oh, returns to us that his powers are yet not ready to raise so great a siege. Therefore, dread king, wield our town and lives to thy soft mercy, and to our gates dispose of us and ours, for we no longer are defensible. Open your gates. Come, Uncle Lexer, go you in the hard floor and remain there, fortified strongly against the French. Use mercy to them all. For us, dear uncle, the winter coming on and sickness growing upon our soldiers, we will retire to Calais. Tonight in the hard floor, we will be your guests. Tomorrow for the march, I'll be addressed.
in bold the nick the sin the put a the Excellent, madame. Tis certain she hath passed the river some, and if she be not fought with all, my lord, let us not live in France. Let us quit all and give our vineyards to a barbarous people. Oh, do it all. Shall a few sprays of us, the emptying of our father's luxury, our ski odds put in a wild and savage stock, spurred up so suddenly in the clouds and overlook their grafters? Normans, but, but bastard Normans, Norman bastards. Dear to bedtime, where have they this metal? Is not their climate foggy, raw, and dull? On whom, as in despite the sun, those pale, killing their fruits with frowns? Can sod and water decoct their cold lunches of valiant heat? And shall our quick blood, spirited with wine, seem frosty? Oh, for honor of our land, let us not hang like roping icicles upon our houses. While some more frosty people sweat drops of gallant youth on our rich fields. By faith and honor, our madams mock at us and plainly say our metal is bred out. And they will give their bodies to the lust of English youth to new store France with bastard warriors. They bid us to the English dancing school, saying that our grace is only in our heels and that we are most lofty runaways. Where is Montjoy the Herald? And with honor edged more sharper than your swords, high to the fields. Charles Delabrac, High Constable of France, High Dukes, Great Princes, Barons, Lords, and Knights, for your great seats now quit you of great shames. Bar Harry England, that sweeps through our land with pennons painted in the blood of Harfleur. Rush on her host, as doth the melted snow. Go down on her, you have power enough. And in a captive chariot, into Rouen, bring her our prisoner. This becomes the great. Sorry am I her numbers are so few, her soldiers sick and famished in their march. For I am sure when she shall see our army, she'll drop her heart into the sink of fear, and for achievement offer us her ransom. Therefore, Lord Constable, haste on Montjoy, and let her say to England that we send to know what willing ransom she will give. Prince of Juan, you shall stay with us in Rowan. Not so, I do receive Be you. Be patient, for you shall remain with us. Now forth, Lord Constable, and princes all, and quickly bring us word of England's fall. I assure you there is very excellent services committed at the bridge. The, 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 the Duke of Exeter is as magnanimous as Agamemnon, and a man that I love and honor with my heart, and my soul, and my life, and my living, and my duty, and my uttermost power. He is not, God be praised and blessed, any heart in the world, but keeps the bridge most valiantly and with excellent discipline. Captain, I do beseech you do me favors. The Jew from Exeter doth love me well. I have praised God and I have merited some love at his hand. Bardolph, a soldier firm and sound of heart, a buxom valor hath by cruel fate and giddy fortune's fickle wheel. That goddess fly that stands upon a rolling restless stone. By your patience, private pistol. Fortune is painted blind with a muffler for her eyes to signify to you that fortune is blind. Captain and she is painted also with a wheel to signify to you that she is turning and inconstant and mutability and variation. And her foot also is fixed upon a spherical stone which rolls and rolls and rolls. In good truth, the poet makes a most excellent description of it. Fortune is an excellent mark. Fortune is Bardolph's foe and frowns upon her, for she hath stolen up packs and hanged, must have be a damned death. 
Let gallows gape for dog. Let man go free, and let not hemp her windpipe suffocate. But Exeter hath given doom of death for packs of little price. Therefore go speak. The Duke will hear thy voice. And let not Bardolph's vital thread be cut by edge of petty court and vile reproach. Private Pistol, I do partly understand your meaning. Why then rejoice therefore? Certainly, Private, it is not a thing to rejoice at. For if, look here, she were my sister, I would desire the Duke to use his good pleasure and put her to execution. For discipline ought to be you. Die and be damned, and fico for thy friendship. It is well. The fig of Spain. Very good. Why, this is an errant, counterfeit rascal. I remember him now, a bomb, a cut purse. I'll assure you I uttered as brave words at the bridge as you shall see in a summer's day. But what he has spoke to me, that is well, I warrant you, when time is served. Why, tis a rogue that now and then goes to the wars to grace himself and is returning to London under the form of a soldier. And such fellows are perfect in the great commander's names, and they will learn you by rote what services were done, who fought bravely, who was shot, who disgraced, what terms the enemy stood on. And this they caught perfectly in the phrase of war, which they trick up with no tone bells, and will do among foreign bottles and our washed wit. It's wonderful to be thought of. I tell you what, Captain Gow, I do perceive that he is not the man he would gladly make show to the world he is. How now, Philip? <clears throat> Came thou from the bridge? Ah, so please your majesty, the Duke of Exeter hath very gallantly maintained the bridge. The French has gone off, look ye, and there is brave and most gallant passages. How many men have you lost, Luella? The perdition of the adversary hath been very great, reasonable great. Mary, for my part, I think the Duke hath never lost a man. But one that is like to be executed for robbing a church, one Bardolph, if your majesty know the soldier. We would have all such men so cut off. And we give express charge that in our marches through the villages there be nothing compelled from them. None of the villagers upbraided or abused in disdainful language. For when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. You know me by my habits. Well then, I know thee. What shall I know of thee? My master's mind. Unfold it. Thus says my king. Tell Harry of England, though we seem dead, we did but sleep. Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. Tell her we could have rebuked her at her floor, but that we thought not good to bruise an injury till it were full ripe. Now speak we upon our cue. And our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, see his weakness, and admire our signs. Bid her, therefore, consider of her ransom, which must proportion the losses we have borne, the subjects we have lost, the disgrace we have digested. For our losses, her exchequer is too poor. For the effusion of our blood, the muster of her kingdom to faint a number, and for our disgrace, her own person kneeling at our feet, but a weak and worthless satisfaction. To this, add defiance. And tell her, in conclusion, she hath betrayed her followers, whose condemnation is pronounced. So much my king. And master, so much my office. What is that name? I know of its quality. Montjoy. Thou dost thy office fairly. Turn thee back. Tell the king I do not seek him now, but could be willing to march on to Calais without impeachment. For, to say the sooth, our people are with sickness much enfeebled. My numbers lessen, and those few I have almost know better than so many French, who when they were in health, I tell thee, Harold, I thought one pair of English legs 
did march three Frenchmen. Go therefore, tell thy master I am here. My ransoms bought this frail and worthless trunk. My army is but a weak and sickly guard, yet God before we will come on. If we shall pass, we will. If we be hindered, we shall your red blood with tawny ground discolor. Therefore, go therefore, Montjoy. The sum of all our answer is but this. We would not seek the battle as we are. Yet as we are, we say we will not shun it. So tell your master. We shall deliver so. Thanks to your highness. I hope they will not come upon us now. We are in God's hand, brothers, not theirs. Will it never be day? I will trot tomorrow a mile, and my way shall be paved with English faces. I will not say so, for fear I should be faced out of my way. But I would have were morning, for I would fain be about the ears of the English, who will go to Hazard with me for twenty prisoners. You must first go yourself to Hazard, ere you have them. Tis midnight. I'll go arm myself. The Dauphin longs for morning. He longs to eat the English. I think he will eat all he kills. He is simply the most active gentleman of France. Doing his activity, and he will still be doing. He never did harm that I heard of. Nor will do none tomorrow. He'll keep that good name still. I know him to be valued. I was told that by one that knows him better than you. What's he? Mary, he told me so himself. What a poor day! <laughs> Alas, poor Harry of England, she longs not for the dawning as we do. <laughs> what a wretched and peevish fellow is this king of England to walk with her fat brain followers so far out of her knowledge! That island of England breeds the most valiant creatures. Their mastiffs are of unmatchable courage. Foolish curs! They run winking into the mouth of a Russian bear and have their heads chomped like that dare eat his breakfast on the lip of a light. Just, just. And the men who sympathize with the mastiffs in robustuous and rough coming on, leaving their wits with their wives. <laughs> but give them great meals of beef and iron and steel, they will eat like wolves and fight like devils. Why, but these English are shrewdly out of beef. Then shall we find tomorrow they have only stomachs to eat and none to fight. <laughs> now it is time to arm. Come, shall we about it? It is now twelve o'clock, but let me see. By ten, we shall have each a hundred English men. <laughs> now, as you obtain conjecture of a time, a creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp, through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds, but the fixed sentinels almost receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire. And through its paley flames, each battle sees the other's umber face. Steed threatens steed in high and boastful nays, piercing the night's dull ear. And from the tents, the armorers accomplishing the knights with busy hammers close rivets up give dreadful note of preparation. Bardo, tis true we are in great danger. The greater therefore should our courage be. There is some soul of goodness in things evil. Would men observingly distill it out? Tomorrow, Captain Gower. A good soft pillow for that good noble head were better than a churlish turf of friends. Oh, not so, my liege. And this logic likes me better, since I may say, not why I am cheap. Give me your cloak. 
clothes, Captain. <laughs> Do my good morrow to them, commend me to the princes in our camp, and I shall follow you. Desire them all to my glory. The Lord in heaven bless thee, noble Herod. A friend discuss unto me. Art thou officer or art thou base, common, and popular? I am a gentleman of a company. Trailest thou the puissant pike? Even so. What are you? As good a gentleman as the emperor. Then you are better than the king. The king? A ball cock and a heart of gold. A lad of life and imp of fame. Of parents most good, of fists to most valiant. I kiss her dirty shoe. And from heart string, I love the lovely bull. <clears throat> what is that in? Harry! Leroy. Leroy. A Cornish name. Art thou of Cornish crew? Nope. Knowst thou Fluellen? Yes. Art thou his friend? And his kinsman, too. The feet go for thee, then. Well, I thank you. God be with you. My name is Pistol Call. Sorts well with your fierceness. admiration in the universal world when the true and ancient laws and wars and prerogatives of the wars is not kept. If you would take the pains but to examine the wars of Pompey the Great, you shall find, I warrant you, that there is no tittle-tattle, no pibble pabble in Pompey's camp. Oh, why, the enemy is loud. You can hear him all night. If the enemy is an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb, is it meat? Think you that we should also look you be an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb in your own conscience now? I will speak low. I pray you and beseech you that you do. Corporal Nim, is not that the morning which breaks yonder? I think it be, for we have no great cause to desire the approach of day. Who goes there? A friend. Under what captain serve you? Under Sir Thomas Irving. Good old commander, and the most kind gentleman. I, I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? Even as men erect upon a sand that looked to be washed off the next tide, we have not told us not to the king. No. no. And he shouldn't. For though I say it to you, I think I am a woman like the king. Therefore, when she sees reason of fears as we do, her reason, her fears, out of doubt, be of the same relish as ours are. Yet, in reason, no soldier should possess themselves with any appearance of fear, lest she, by showing it, disheartens her army. They may show what outward courage they will, but I believe, as cold a night as tis, they would wish themselves in Thames up to the neck so we were quit here. By my troth, I will speak my conscience of the king. I think she would not wish herself anywhere but where she is. Then I would she were here alone, so that she should be sure to be ransomed and many a poor men's lives saved. I dare say you love her not so ill to wish her here alone. The king herself had a heavy reckoning to make. When all those arms and legs and heads chopped off in a battle, She'll join together at the latter day and cry all, We died at such a place. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children, 
Raleigh left. I have a fear there are a few die well to die in a battle. How can they charitably dispose of anything when blood is their argument? Now, if these men do not die well, it will be a doom-laden matter for the king that led them to it. The king is not bound to answer the particular endings of her soldiers, for she purposes not their endings when she purposes their services. Every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Therefore should every soldier do as every sick man in his bed, wash every mote out of his conscience. And in dying so, death is to him a vantage. Or, not dying, the time was blessedly lost, wherein such preparation was gained. It were not sin to think that making God so free an offer, he let him outlive that day, to see his greatness, and to teach others how they should prepare. Tis certain. <laughs> Every man that dies ill, oh, the ill upon his own head, the king is not to answer. I do not desire that the king should answer for me, yet I determined to fight lustily for her. I myself heard the king say she would not be ransomed. <laughs> <laughs> I, she said so to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, she may be ransomed, and we ne'er the wiser. If I live to see it, I will never trust her word hereafter. <laughs> oh, oh, you pay with it. Oh, there's a perilous shot out of an elder gun that a poor and private displeasure can do against a monarch. You may as well go about to turn the sun to ice by fanning in her face with a peacock's feather. Your reproof is something too round. I would be angry with you if time were convenient. But let it be a quarrel between us, if you live. I am with you. Keep thy word. Fare thee well. Be friends, you English fools. Be friends. We have French quarrels enough if you could tell how to reckon. Service, nay. 
melt them and make incisions in their hides that their hot blood will spin in English eyes and doubt them with superfluous courage. Ha! What? Will you have them weep our horses' blood? How shall we then see their natural tears? The English are embattled. Why do you stay so long, my lords of France? To horse! You gallant princes, straight to horse! Do but behold yon poor and starved band, and our fair show shall suck away their souls, leaving them but the shales and husks of men. There is not work enough for all our hands, scarce blood enough in all their sickly veins to give each naked girdle access let us but blow on them. The vapor of our valor will o'erturn them. Tis positive against all exceptions, lords, that our superfluous lackeys were enough to purge this field of such a building foe. Though we upon this mountain's basis by took stand for idle speculation, but that our honors must not. What's to say? A very little, little let us do, and all is done. Then let the trumpet sound, the tucket sonnet, and the note to mount, for our approach shall such as dare the field, as England shall crouch down in fear and yield. Ah! 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 Of fighting men, they have full three score thousand. There's five to one. Besides, they're all fresh. God's arms strike with us. Oh, that we now have here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin, Wesley. Oh, fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are not to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By God, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I to feed upon my cost. It earns me not if men my garments wear such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul. Today is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that sees this day and lives old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, that he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then will our names be in their flowing cups, freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son. And Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few. We happy few. We band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And the gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here. Now, soldiers, march away. And how thou pleaseth God, dispose the day.
everlasting shame sits mocking in our plumes. Oh, evil fortune. Why, all our ranks are broke. Oh, perdurable shame. Let's stab ourselves. Be these the wretches we played at dice for? Is this the king we sent to for her ransom? Shame, an eternal shame, nothing but shame. These order that have spoiled us, spread us now. Let us on heaps go offer up our lives. We are not yet living in the field. To smother up the English in our drums, if any order be thought upon. Oh, the devil take order now. All to the throng. Let life be short, else shame will be too long. First I, then York, all haggled over, comes to him where in gore he lay in steeped. He grabs him by his beard, kisses the gashes that did yawn upon his face, cries aloud, tear you, my cousin Suffolk. My soul shall mine give company to heaven. Tear you, sweet soul, for mine. Then fly abreast, as in this Glorious and well fought in field, we kept together in our chivalry. He smiles me in the face, wrought my hand, and with a feeble gripe says, My dear Lord, commend my service to my sovereign. Here comes the herald of the French, my liege. What means this, Harold? Knowest thou not that I have fined these bones of mine for ransom? Comest thou again for ransom? No, great king. I come to thee for charitable license, that we may wander o'er this bloody field to look our dead and then to bury them. To sort our nobles from our common men, for many of our princes. Whoa. Why? Why? Drowned and soaked in mercenary blood. So do our vulgar drench their peasant limbs in blood of princes, whose wounded steeds fret fetlock deep in gore, and with wild rage yerk out their arm and heels at their dead masters, killing them twice. Oh, give us leave, great king, to view the field in safety and dispose of their dead bodies. I tell thee truly, Harold, I know not if the day be ours or no, for yet a many of your horsemen peer and gallop over the field. The day is yours. Praise it be God, and not our strength for it. What is this castle that stands hard by? They call it Ashen Court. Then call me this the field of Ashen Court, fought on the day of Crispin, Crispian. What's the one, or the dead number? Here's the number of the slaughtered French. This note doth tell me of ten thousand that in the field lie slain, of princes in this number, and of nobles bearing banners. There lie dead one hundred twenty-six. Added to these of knights, of squires, and gallant gentlemen, eight thousand and four hundred, of the which five hundred were but yesterday dubbed knights. 
So that in these 10,000 that lie in the field slain, there are but 1,600 mercenaries. The rest are princes, barons, lords, knights, squires, and gentlemen of blood and quality. The names of those their nobles that lie dead. Charles Delabre, High Constable of France. Jacques of Chatillon, High Duke of France. The Governor of Harlem, Lord Ramiers. Great Master of France, the brave Sir Richard Dauphin. John, Duke of Alençon, Anthony, Duke of Brabant, and the Duke of Orleans. Here was a royal fellowship of death. Now, what are the names of our English men? Your council presently to sit with us once more. 
with better heed so that we may resurvey them and we will pass our accept and peremptory answer. Brother, we shall. Go you, Uncle Exeter and Westmoreland, go you with the king and take with you free power to ratify, argument, or alter as your wisdoms best shall see advantageable for our dignity. Anything in or out of our demands and we'll consign thereto. Oh, will you, fair lady, go you with the princes or stay here with us? Our gracious brother, I will go with them. Happily a woman's voice may do some good when articles too nicely urged be stood on. Yet keep our cousin Catherine with us. She is our capital demand, uh, comprised within the four rank of our articles. She hath good leave. Fair Catherine, and most fair, about safe to teach a soldier terms that shall enter at a lady's ear and plead her love suit to her gentle heart. Your majesty shall mock at me. I cannot speak your England. Oh, Catherine, if you would love me with your French tongue, I would be glad to hear you confess it brokenly with your English. Do you like me, Kate? Pardon me, moi, I cannot tell what is like me. An angel is like you, Kate. You are like an angel. Oh, bon Dieu! Les langues sont anglais, sont pleins de trompettes. But the tongues of the English are full of deceits. I know no ways to mince it in love, but directly to say I love you. Then if you urge me further to say do you in faith, I wear out my suit. Give me your answer in faith, do. And so clap hands at a bargain. What say you, lady? Stop what's going up, me understand well. Mary, if you would put me to verses or to dance for your sake, why, Kate, you undid me. For the one, I have neither words nor measure, and for the other, I have no strength in measure. Well, yet a reasonable measure and strength. Uh, but I know of no other ways to miss it. What say you, my lady? Is it possible that I should love the enemy of France? No, it is not possible that you should love the enemy of France. But in loving me, you should love the friend of France. For I love France so well, I will not part with the village of it. I cannot tell. No, Kate. Canst thou love me? I do not know that. No, tis hereafter to know, but now to promise. Do but now promise, Kate, that you will endeavor for your French part of such a boy, and for my English mighty. Take the words of a king and a bachelor. How say you, La Trubelle, Catherine, Dumont, Montrecher, et Domine de Sea? <laughs> Your Majesty, I was French enough to deceive the most savage demoiselle that was on heart. Now fire upon my false French. I swear to you in plain English, I love thee, Kate. Put off your maiden blushes. Avouch the faults of your heart and with looks of an empress. Take me by the hand and say, Harry of England, I am thine. Which words thou shalt most sooner bless my ear with all, but I will tell thee aloud, England is thine. Ireland is thine, France is thine, and Harry Plantagenet is thine. Wilt thou have me? That is as it shall please le roi mon père. Well, nay, it shall please him well, Kate, it shall please him, Kate. Okay. Then it shall also content me. Upon that, I kiss your hand and call you my queen. <laughs> lasse, Monseigneur, lasse, lasse. Hey, ma foi, je ne vous prends que pour bassier, votre grand dieu, en baisant la main de votre signe de l'indigné serviteur. Excusez-moi. 
There's a souffle do you want to play a few songs in there? I should kiss your lips then. Oh, the dame de moiselle, but the baiser de bon dog no say in less than two for Paris. Did you have Princess English? Oh, I would have her learn how perfectly I love her, and that is good English. Mm. Is she not apt? Shall Kate be my wife? So please you. I am content. And so the maiden cities you wait on shall wait on her. We have consented to all terms of reason. Is it so, my lord? He hath granted every article, his daughter first, and the sequel all, according to their firm proposed natures. Only, you have not yet subscribed to this. Your Highness demands that the King of France have in any occasion to write the matter of grant. Names, Your Highness, in this form and with this addition. Our dear Henry Plantagenet, heir to France. Nor this I have not, sister, so deny, but your request shall make me let it pass. Well, in love and dear alliance, let that one article rank with the rest, and thereupon give me your daughter. Take her, fair daughter, and with her blood raise up issue to me that the contending kingdoms of France and England whose shores are pale with envy of each other's happiness shall cease their hatred, and this dear conjunction plant neighborhood and Christian-like accord in each other's sweet bosoms. That never war advance his bleeding sword twixt England and fair France. God, the best maker of all marriages, combine your hearts in one, your realms in one, as spouses both, being two, are one in love, so be there twixt your kingdom such a spousal that never may ill office or fell jealousy, which troubles off the bed of blessed marriage, thrust in between the passions of these kingdoms to make divorce of their incorporate league, that English may as French, French, English men receive each other. God, speak this amen. 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 Thus far, with each drop and all unable pen, our bending author has pursued the story in little room, finding mighty men, mangling by stars the full course of their glory. But be contented when that fell arrest without all bail shall carry me away. My life hath in this line some interest, which for remembrance still with thee shall stay. When thou reviewest this, thou must review the very part that was consecrate to thee. The earth can have but earth, which is his due. My spirit is thine, the better part of me. So then thou hast but lost the dregs of life. Pray a worm. My body being dead. The coward conquest of a wretch's knife. No base of thee to be remembered. The worth of that 